Hello, I'm Ali Thompson from Hey Legal. The Shaping Your Success channel promised interviews with innovators, disruptors, entrepreneurs and more, asking them about their success, what they think of the legal sector and how lawyers can think differently. In keeping with that brief, I am joined in this video by one of the UK's leading entrepreneurs, Chris van der Kuhl. Chris is an entrepreneur who has worked in the technology, media and entertainment sectors. He is the founder and owner of 4G Studios based in Dundee, the company responsible for the console editions of Minecraft, one of the most successful video games of all time. He is the founding chairman of Entrepreneurial Scotland. In this episode, we talk about lawyers being entrepreneurial enablers. The best law firms I see out there today are the ones that see themselves as entrepreneurial enablers, especially the commercial law side of it, but, but that goes to almost everything. The role lawyers can and should play. Why, if you are not adding value, you are probably too expensive. And why new ways of thinking, some chaos and risk is necessary in business. Clearly, the impact of technology on every sector is incredible. I, then that's what you've got to embrace. I, and the good thing, especially for younger people or earlier career stage people, is sometimes it can be a bit of a leveler because things change so much that the bonus that you had if you'd been around for 20 or 30 years and knew everything, that currency isn't as valuable as it once, as it once was. I begin by welcoming Chris and asking him what he expects from lawyers. In fact, thanks for uh, for having me on, on the show today. I, Thank you. I, th I think the first thing I'd say is uh, every lawyer that I work with would tell you that I'm constantly challenging them uh, in some way, uh, most especially my wife, who's a, who's a lawyer too. Um, so I've grown up surrounded by, uh, by many from the legal profession. It's a profession that I know well. Uh, both from the outside as a client, but also from the inside, uh, li living with a partner in a law firm uh, too. Uh, and it's been interesting, you know, over my career to watch how the legal profession um, has evolved, uh, and as it has in many cases, and then not so, uh, not so much in, in others. Um, I, look, the, the best law firms I see out there today uh, are the ones that see themselves as entrepreneurial enablers especially the commercial law side of it, but, but that goes to almost everything, even on the commercial side, even commercial litigation. The get best commercial litigation people I talk to are not there to, you know, fire me into a fee hell in, in, in a lifetime in a court, but they're actually there to help us think strategically and tactically about, look, if we've got a bit of a challenge on somehow, how do we resolve this in a way that hopefully wins for everybody uh, around the table? And I think that's the key thing. Gone are the days for me when I view a lawyer as a, as a necessary evil. I view a lawyer uh, in the context, of the many contexts that we use, legal, the legal profession, um, as an, an entrepreneurial enabler. The great lawyers that I've got around, uh, you know, around our organisations help us get stuff done. And then, albeit when you're really into it, like, We've just uh, recently completed the disposal of uh, of TV Squared. Uh, that's the point when you know lawyers really come into their own, and you get a, a deal and an agreement structured with something that's as complex as that, with a US public company on one side, multiple investors behind a, a private company on the other side, um, and that's when I I'm in awe of the profession for how they organise and execute um, and manage risk uh, in a way that these things are so complex I, I and that's the point where i absolutely do not challenge my lawyers too much or let them let them lead us the short answer to i uh, to, to your question is i um, we all learn from each other all businesses should, and, and, and legal professional organizations especially in le recent years where they've moved away from traditional partnership a lot of them into liability setups and things they have to absolutely think like any business that, that i know and the best ones, the ones I enjoy interacting with, that's exactly how they think of themselves. Yeah. Brilliant. And do you think that the role of a lawyer has changed in your experience since you first started to interact with them? Yeah. I th look, I, th I think it would be safe to say that the best 
legal partners out there, I, to, to legal partners to business I, I, out there have always acted in a, in the kind of way we're talking about. I've grown up in the Scot in Scotland with the legends of, of certain lawyers that you hear and how they facilitated amazing collaborations with their clients and went way above and beyond just the base transaction. And if you think about it, I, the legends that are still operating today, like a guy like Bruce Minto and that firm, what they, what they've managed to achieve, especially around sort of investment trust world and, um, and things, you know, it's almost impossible to think about that sector of the business market in Edinburgh without thinking of Bruce and the team there and, and what they've done. Ha have they changed? No, I, I don't necessarily. The world's evolved, so there's new types of There's great lawyers that I know that, as technically savvy as I am, really understand the tech market. There's a, there's a few of those. And so when it comes to me thinking about going to try and do this with technology, they are the first names on my call list because I know they'll A, understand what I'm talking about and B, they'll add value on top of me because they'll come at it from a different perspective. And that's what I'm really looking for. I'm not really looking for uh, something. We need execution of something and it's simple and, and it's easy, but that's commoditized. You're, you're, I'm sure in the profession, people have been talking about it. There is no question where it's commodity service, it's going to get disintermediated, whether it's AI, whether it's legal services firms, I, it's been happening for years. If you're not really, don't kid yourself on, if you're not really adding value, you're probably too expensive. Whereas on the other side of it, if you're truly uh, adding value from a, and I would call it from a creative point of view, thinking about the challenges and coming up with solutions, then, then your value is immeasurable. You're part of the team. And we've found that over the years, we've got some incredible legal professionals that are embedded in their businesses now. And it's interesting because it suits them from a sort of lifestyle choice. But these are people who've been senior partners in big, in big firms. And we all know what that comes with in terms of fee targets and all of that. And over time, I've just realized that, do you know what? I can actually lock myself in I, to the businesses. I enjoy it far more. I can add more value I, from a reward point of view. Financially, it can be rewarding, but I think from a, probably from the, from the purposes of being part of the business for those individuals, it's far, far more rewarding. I also see the opposite where I see great entrepreneurial lawyers who get really excited about their own business. How can we grow it? How can we make it deliver more value? How can we make it better? And I think, and I think there, I, some of the structural changes around move to limited liability and things have been quite exciting for those type of people uh, because they, they give them opportunities to be more entrepreneurial. Uh, and I also think in Scotland, it's been not a bad period of time for maybe some firms that were, you know, the classic old school professional services who didn't really think about the, their own business very much. And with you know, governance being where it is, with all sorts of other things coming in, they've struggled. So that slight consolidation that's happened, it's, I think, a good thing I, around it. Have they changed? Yes, people have changed with the times because the world we live in is a completely different world. The digital execution of stuff, all, all that kind of you know, stuff. Yes, the good lawyers have moved there a long time ago. I, but ultimately, what's also interesting is if you go and look back, I mean, I've got a reasonably long career. You can see that the great lawyers of their time were, were always adding more than process and they were never hired because they had to be good. Their firms had to be great and incredibly trustworthy and capable. But actually what you're really going for was the spark that they gave, the value that they gave and the counsel that they gave. Yeah. So trusted advisors, sector knowledge, legal expertise, bringing all of that together, knowing your world, yeah. you know, taking it forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, are there other, would you go so far to say that currently we are living in a revolution in terms of a digital revolution, the pace of change, if you think the gaming industry, for example, the gaming, the size of that industry as it is now compared to yeah. what it may have been 20 years ago, these are revolutionary times. Sure. Look, we, something I'm really fond of saying is the pandemic has even made this more, uh, resonate even more. We we're living in the time of the fastest change in human history. None of us have ever lived through anything like this before. 
it's probably but it's only getting faster and that's both exciting and frightening in, in, in equal measure I, so inevitably because of that if you think you can hold on to a methodology of practice or whatever that you were doing 10 or 20 years you're going to be dead on your feet I, and equally if you think we've just had a restructure or I've just learned this or I've just done a masters and I've got so if this is me I'm set now forget it this is just the beginning to open the door to whatever's coming next and some of it I can see some of it I can't but what I can safely say is embracing change is the only way I, that anybody will thrive it doesn't matter what they're doing and where they are I'm fighting against it is a uh, there is a choice there's a choice to check out like go and I don't know find a rural idol somewhere <laughs> I probably use the internet to make your money but here who knows don't, don't use the internet to make money go and farm and be happy that's perfectly relevant and perfectly reasonable but I think if you can't be half in it if you're in the game if you're in business in and around you know, around the world that's changing so fast and you know, clearly the impact of technology on every sector is incredible I then that's what you've got to embrace I um, and the good thing especially for younger people or earlier career stage people is sometimes it can be a bit of a leveler because things change so much that the the bonus that you had if you'd been around for 20 or 30 years and knew everything that currency isn't as valuable as it once as it once was and that can be hard for people because like wait a minute, I'm used to just knowing everything and now all of a sudden I know nothing and actually I can't either can't be bothered or wasn't expecting it and changing behavior to I'm going to have to go and relearn and do things in a different way can be really challenging for people I think but that's the facts of life that's where we are yeah and th that's fantastic and that brings us on uh, to a point I did want to ask you about my son uh, looked at the University of Aberdeen, the, the gaming, and it, I really enjoyed visiting the campus and seeing it being set up like a software company and the way he tried to replicate that. And uh, there was a quote in some of the paraphernalia from, I think it was one of the directors of Ubisoft talking about them looking forward to the graduates from Aberdeen coming into their business because they would bring, they were bringing new ideas and it could be considered that the youth or the new graduates coming into law firms aren't received in the same way currently mm -hmm. that they come in and it's very much a hierarchical system. So is there anything you think law firms or senior leaders in, in law could learn from a world that you know very well, which is maybe more receptive to the ideas of youth and change? Yeah, I think why wouldn't you uh, ask for an, an embrace, an, an embrace change in your ideas? What, why wouldn't you? What, why would you create a structure that's not encouraged? Right? It seems bizarre to me that anybody would, would even think about doing that. And the challenge clearly is without being condescending or with the right structure, especially those that have been in a business for a long time, you've got a little bit of a bias towards yeah I've seen that before and we know it doesn't work but that's not a reason not to let somebody give it a try in a different in a different way so it's a balance between not thinking that youth and exuberance solves everything because it doesn't I, and generally if youth and exuberance you know, is the only thing that drives the business the the level of change will ultimately be catastrophic more than likely so you need this, and it's the same with any high growth company, you need this balance between not tempering, uh, you know, or temper possibly, but not muting that exuberance because it's the energy that drives it. And actually people around that exuberance going, great, okay, look, let's put, give you a, give you an environment to try this out in that won't kill the whole company. Well, let's see if it works. Well, it does work. Okay. Those of us have been around a bit longer. We now know how to systemize that and help and support it. Let's do it. But that was brilliant. We never would have thought of that. So it's creating teams and that are balanced in that way. I, I, that to me is the most important thing in any organization that each part of an organ or however diverse it is, and diversity comes in many shapes, sizes, colors, everything. And neurodiverse, especially, you know, when people just think differently and think we're weird, they, they don't think like me, put your hands up. That's good. 
Like, cause there's, you want people who don't think like you and, and the trick is to have enough respect and understanding to go, okay, you don't think like me, but show me what you are thinking. And I don't understand how you're coming up with this, but show me what the result is. And the flip side is true. Even if I don't understand that it, it's difficult to communicate, find a way to do it. Because actually, if you can do that, it's such a powerful thing. You bring all these views and opinions that are coming at him from different angles. And then somehow you can work out and measure, actually, this is the best for something when none of us ever expected to happen. That's great. And it's doing that in a way that back to my first point, doesn't, you know, doesn't cause total chaos. A little bit of chaos is good, but total chaos is not good. And especially clearly in a regulated environment, like a, a law firm also where your clients are absolutely reliant on trust and capability. So if you are going, and that has to be one of the reasons why, you know, in a games company, we can try things that will blow up the game tomorrow and well, we'll sort that, it'll be fine. You don't experiment on, with people's lives if you're a doctor, I, other than in obviously clinically very secure environments, I really got to put thought into that. And the same thing, you've got to change something fundamental in the way that you I, deliver legal services. You better be sure that you've tried it out properly um, and it's there. You don't follow the, the slightly uh, OTT mentality of software businesses, which is doesn't matter if you fail as long as you fail fast and sort it out. If you were the transaction that was failed upon and you lost a fortune, imagine what professional indemnity uh, policies would cost pretty quickly. So I'm cognizant of the fact that if you're going to apply some of the techniques that we apply in, in, you know, in really early stage, high growth companies, you can do it, but you have to put training wheels around it and, you know, nice soft bumpers around it to make sure that, uh, you know, no clients will be harmed in the, in the making of this new idea. Yeah. So there's no culture of failure. There's no culture of really learning. It's very, very different. Oh, there might be a, a slight kind of sandbox type project that may be something that can drive innovation forward, but, but kind of at the DNA of the business failure, pushing boundaries really can't be too, uh, much in the mix really. And obviously lawyers are trained to be by definition risk averse. So they're more likely to to see yeah. problems and opportunity. There, there's a thing, isn't it? Should they be? Because actually what I'm looking to my lawyer to do is help me take risk. You know, I'm saying, look, in this business, I've, I can see this, I can see this, but I can also see that I could completely screw it up. And you know, you know, there's liabilities of, you know, Kimbo rather than come in and do the easy thing, which is to say, do not do it. Yeah. And those lawyers are long gone from my world. Anybody that comes up with a, sorry, you cannot do that. I'm like, well, hold on a second. That's not your job. Your job is to help me find a way to do it. Not to tell me, you might quite legitimately come in and say, the way you think you're going to do that, you cannot do that. That would, the risk is so great that if you get that wrong, you lose everything. Do, do not do that. Okay. So next question, what should I do then? And that's the more important one. I need, I need the, the goalkeeper to sit to to save the ball from going in the net to start with job done number one but job number two is right how do we take the ball up the other end and score because yeah. if what you're telling me is i've now got the ball and i'm keeping it and you can't have it back i'm stuffed doubly because my business can't go anywhere so yeah. you know our approach to risk is defined as follows which is we should manage risk to where we can take as much risk as we possibly can without fatally wounding the, the thing that we're trying to build in the first place. And you can get the definitions of that, decide where your level of tolerance is uh, around it. But when you set it, I, the last thing you need is anybody coming near you whose view is, I will stop you. I, I will help you make, take no risk. Like the last person I ever want to meet because we're, we're done. Probably the easiest way to take no risk is to not be here any longer. Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 it's fundamentally necessary to take risk. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It's been absolutely brilliant to talk to you. Mind blowing. It makes me, I'm going to, when we stop recording on here, I think go away and ponder much of what I spend my own time doing. And that is the essence of what we're trying to achieve with the, the content we've created here. So I'm sure you'll inspire many lawyers and hopefully a wider audience as well to think differently uh, with what they've heard today. So thank you so much, Chris. It's massively appreciated. Thank <laughs> you.